this summer, our theme has been the story. We have been marching systematically through the Old Testament, starting with Genesis. We have talked about kings and prophets. We have talked about patriarchs. We have talked about deliverers and judges. We have talked about a lot of human sin and rebellion. Today, we are at the end of the Old Testament. And first, I want to wrap that up before we can go to what God has made new. Are you ready for the new? Are you tired of the mess? Let's begin today. Here's the way that I always like to tell this story. Have you ever heard anybody say, we've, how many times have we said that over these months? And usually then what happens is, theologically, or, or bad theolo <laughs> theologically, uh, did you know that all of us are theologians? I mean, some people get paid for it. Uh, they are often the seminary professors. Uh, others uh, are practical theologians. Uh, that's kind of my job in the church. Uh, I'm called to take what God has taught and proclaim it to you. I'm called to teach you. It's, it's an awesome responsibility uh, because your faith is in my hands. And I'm simply called to try and be faithful to proclaim the word of God to you. And in many ways, your faith is partly in my hands. That's a scary thing. But did you know that you're a theologian? Everyone is a theologian. Everyone thinks about God. Now, some think about God and reject him, and they're atheologians, atheists. But we're all theologians. We think things about God. And if we think the wrong things about God, nothing makes sense. And so my goal this summer has been to tell the whole story. I couldn't get in every detail. Does that surprise you? As, even as long as I talk sometimes, I couldn't get in all the details. But I wanted to hit the high points. Because if you don't understand what the Old Testament is about, the New Testament doesn't truly, deeply make sense. So let's walk through the Old Testament. Have you ever heard anybody say? And then what begins to happen is people begin to scapegoat God. If only God had done this, if only God had done that. Uh, my tendency is to say, it's not God who needs to be scapegoated for all of the problems in this world. In fact, let me tell you my simple image that helps me understand uh, why there is so much fallen and brokenness. Now, some of us, once we fell, once we sin, we can understand so much of what happens is sin. Uh, it's things that we do to ourselves. It's things that we do to others. You know, sometimes people look at like a, a hurricane and they say, what a horrible act of God. How could God do this? Uh, you know, if you study things like hurricanes, uh, what you realize is that hurricanes actually replenish. Uh, they, they move sand around. They open up new things. They create life in new places. The rivers overflow. But we as humans don't like water in our backyard, so we put up dams, which chases more destruction down the river. Uh, the rich get to live on secure parts of ground. But in places like New Orleans, where do the poor live? They live in the places that are going to flood first. Why? Because of sin. And so, so much of the destruction that we see, and we say it's an act of God, and some people like to blame it on God is not of God. It's a product of sin. But here is, here's my simple way of understanding. It's like, okay, maybe you can explain that uh, hurricanes rearrange water and sand and coastlines and all of those things. Maybe I can get that. 
that uh, when floods come, they provide needed moisture, even though it's too much at one time. It does change and shape things. Uh, maybe I can get that. I don't understand tornadoes. I don't understand disease. I don't understand how a good God, and, and there we go. We are scapegoating God again and again and again and again and again. All right, here's my simple way of explaining it. Uh, I used to be able, and you've heard me use this before, I used to be able to spin a basketball on my fingers. I was really good at it. I could move between fingers, but I would spin the basketball on my fingers. One of the things I have to keep doing, and it's why I do this, is that I have to keep the momentum up, that centrifugal force. If I keep the speed up, it'll spin for a long time. As soon as I take my hand off, it begins to wobble. What sin does is tell God to take his hand off the world. And everything is wobbling on its axis. God intended perfection. That's how the story started. God will end with perfection. But in this meantime, and sometimes it is a mean time, what happens is brokenness brokenness right we are wobbling this world is not as it was designed to be and so here's the ways you can probably think of more but here's a few of the ways that we tend to scapegoat God if only God had created everything perfect God says I did but perfect didn't work because if you create beings who by definition are not God, they will, and you give them free will, they eventually will sin. Perfect didn't work. Uh, yeah, but if only God had created everything like one big happy family. God says, I did, but what happened in the first family? Cain killed Abel. Yeah, well, if only God, things are so bad, it's so messy right now, if only God would just start all over again. God says, I did. But when the only righteous man in all of the world got off the boat, he planted a vineyard, got drunk, drunk, lay naked, and humiliated his family. Yeah, yeah, but only if we could learn to work better together. <laughs> when you did that, Tower of Babel, you begin to think that you were God. Well, if only God would choose one group of people. I understand not everybody's going to get it, but if only God would choose one group of people and work through them. God says, I tried that with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and it didn't work so well with the patriarchs and all of Israel. And guess what? It's not working perfectly with the church now. Well, if only God would give us a sign, a miracle. God says, I gave you Ten signs in a row. Then I parted the Red Sea. But how long on the other side of the Red Sea did it take you to start complaining? Three days. The effects of signs and wonders lasts three days. Yeah, well, if only God would just tell us what to do. God says, I did. Top of Mount Sinai. Ten commandments. 613 laws. I have given you the word of God. And you ignored it for the first thousand years. Yeah, yeah, but if only God would give us prophets and priests and kings and judges and teachers and... God says, I did. You didn't follow them and you don't follow me. Well, if only God, and we'll go back to this one, would tell us what to do. We just did last week the Ezra and Nehemiah. They began that with that hunger for God finally really kind of truly jewish religion began and they didn't follow what god said for the first thousand years and then after the next 500 years of trying to follow they became so legalistic that by the time of jesus it was like the pharisees were choking the life out of people they were whitewashed tombs they might have looked good to the world on the outside but inside they were full of death and decay. But did you hear it? If only God would do this. If only God would do that. Once in there, it was like, okay, if only we could work together. And you probably could say, if only we would learn to obey. Do you know what I think the whole Old Testament was for? Let me ask it this way. 
Jesus, if you read the beginning of the Gospels, which we're beginning to turn to, uh, Genesis begins in the beginning. Uh, the world was formless and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved over the waters. Do you remember how it begins in John? It simply says that in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was this Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory as of a Father's only Son. Jesus is the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. His glory is as a Father's only Son. So in the beginning was Jesus. And so here's my way of looking at the beginning of creation. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are sitting eternally in heaven. All right, I'm kind of anthropomorphizing this. They're sitting together. They're having this discussion. The Father says, so it's been the decided. We are going to create. Yes, yes, say the Son and the Spirit. We are going to create the heavens and the earth. Yes, yes, the Son and the Spirit are so excited. We are going to create humans upon the earth. Oh, the Son and the Spirit, they are thrilled. So God looks down and says, so we're going to create the heavens and the earth. We're going to create humanity. Jesus, you know what that means there. And from the very beginning of time, Jesus says, I know what that means. If we create beings that are not gods and we give them free will, there will come a time when they sin, when they rebel against us. And that means that if we do this creation, I'm going to have to go down there and die to save them from their sin. I am going to have to take their sins on me because sin is sin and the wages of sin is death. And someone has to pay that price. And from the beginning of time, I will pay that price. And let me tell you why that's so important. Because sometimes people look at this story and they don't understand it. You know, if Jesus was going to be the Savior when Adam and Eve sinned, why didn't he come down right then? It would have saved a lot of trouble. He could have done it, right? Right then. Why didn't he come right then? Because we had more excuses. <laughs> you know, if ever God had only created everything perfect, if, if Jesus had come right then, we would have said, well, that, that was silly of Jesus to come. Because if only God had created things like one big happy family, then we could have saved ourselves. And if Jesus had come then, well, if only God had just started over again. At every point, we had to get our excuses out. Uh, we can't work together and do it. We can't try and improve ourselves. We can't just try and follow the law. We can't do it on our own. And all of our scapegoating of if only God had done this, we can see miracles and three days later, we are focused on ourselves. Again and again, God can tell us what to do, and we do not do it. Sounds like uh, that verse in Romans. The good that I want to do, I do not do. Wretched man that I am, who will... Here's the key word, save me. The whole purpose of the Old Testament, my opinion, told you I'm a theologian, <laughs> so are you, but you need to think rightly. My interpretation of the whole Old Testament is that it got rid of all of our excuses, thinking somehow we could do it ourselves if only God set up the conditions. We can't. And so the whole point of the Old Testament is to bring us to the point of saying, you know what? We need a Savior. Did you hear our first lesson for today from Hebrews chapter 1? Long ago, God spoke to the people of old through the prophets. 
in many and various ways. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Jesus was there at creation going, I know what this means. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, when he saved us, when he died on the cross for us, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is most excellent over theirs. This is Jesus. The whole purpose of the Old Testament, we can't save ourselves. We need a Savior. And so the New Testament begins. It begins with, in the beginning was the Word. It begins with, in the Gospel of Luke, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. For unto you today is born in the city of David a Savior. That's how it begins. All of the Old Testament, we can't save ourselves. New Testament, we have a Savior. Long ago, God spoke to the people of old in many and various ways by the prophets. Now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. This is the new beginning. We can't do it ourselves. Will we accept the Savior? I want to read for you a very quick summary of the Gospel of Mark. I want to give you a quick summary of what the Gospel is. Uh, others could do it in another way, but here is my way of doing it. And I love telling this story. Uh, it starts with, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, alternately translated Messiah, the anointed one, the one that God has chosen, uh, the Son of God. This is the beginning of the good news, the gospel of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. I'm going to tell you that word Son of God is the key to unlocking all of this all right so Jesus is born and there's a messenger going before him a prophet we're gonna know that it's John the Baptist Jesus goes and is baptized by John the Baptist then the Holy Spirit drives him into the wilderness so he's driven into the wilderness Jesus comes out of the wilderness after being tempted by Satan and how many people does he have with him following zero all right so, so Jesus starts with zero this is still in the first chapter of Mark verse 16 as Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee he saw Simon with his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea and Jesus called them follow me and I will make you fishers of men I'll make you fish for people all right so Jesus went from zero to two and then he called James and John they left their nets immediately and followed and Jesus went from zero to two to four and the people of God are beginning to expand, all right? So they went to Simon Peter's house. Uh, Simon and Andrew, James and John, zero to two to four. And Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever lift, left her, and she began to serve them. All right, so the first healing. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. So here's our pattern. From zero to two to four to now gathered around the door. Ha <laughs> isn't that interesting? So, we go to the beginning of chapter 2. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, 
it was reported that he was at home, his, his earthly home, uh, during his ministry of Capernaum. Uh, so many, so many gathered around there that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of that door. And he began speaking the word to the people. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. All right? So from zero to two to four, they gathered around the door. They can't fit through the door, so they lowered their friend from ceiling to floor. And by the way, I love what Jesus does here. He looks at the man and says, here's the paralyzed man. Why did he come? He wanted to watch. Jesus said to him, your sins are forgiven. And if I were the man, I'd go, no, I don't, want, I don't care about my sins. I want to walk. But how long does earthly healing last? You heal a baby, 100 years, outer limit of what it'll last. How long does forgiveness last? We need a Savior. Okay? So from zero to two to four, to gathered around the door, to can't fit through the door. Here's the next one. Chapter 3, verse 7. Jesus departed with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him. From zero to two to four, to gathered around the door, to can't fit through the door. So they lowered their friend from ceiling to floor. So soon, the crowd kept growing, so they went to the shore. <laughs> Still in chapter 3, it says, uh, Jesus then began to tell his disciples to have a boat ready for him because, the because of the crowd, so that they would not crush him. They were going to push him into the sea. They were so hungry for what he did. They were reaching out. They were touching the hem of his cloak. They wanted what he had. They were pushing him into the sea. Jesus told his disciples, have a boat ready just in case. So from zero to two to four, to can't fit through the door. So they lowered their friend uh, from ceiling to floor. So the crowd kept growing, so they went to the shore. And now Jesus said, have a boat just in case he did implore. All right? So chapter 4. Again, Jesus began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into the boat on the sea and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. <laughs> so from zero to two to four, they can't fit through the door, so they lowered their friend to the ceiling to floor. Uh, they went to the shore, have a boat he implored, and now he hopped in a boat because he was massively adored. <laughs> he had to teach from there. And the next one, next piece in this story, uh, and we're about done with the first half of the gospel. I can do this quick. Uh, it says, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told them all that he had done. He went away to a deserted place, and when it was evening, they said, look, the crowd is large. They have no feed to, food to eat. Send them away. Jesus said, no, you feed them. They have, we have nothing but a few loaves and a few fish. Uh, Jesus took and blessed it and broke it. Did you ever see that prefigurement? Uh, gave it to them. There were 12 baskets full left over. And the last line says, those who had eaten the loaves numbered 5,000 men. And the others clarified, besides women and children. So you add women and children, you know, because where there's men, there's going to be women. And where there's men and women, there's going to be children. It's probably 20,000. So from zero to two to four, to gathered around the door, to can't fit through the door, so they lower their friend to ceiling to floor. Uh, because the crowd kept growing, they went to the shore. Jesus soon said, have a boat ready. He did implore. He hopped in a boat because he was massively adored. And soon the crowd now was 20,000 or more. Do you see that massive growth in the crowd? All right? And then we come to Mark chapter 8. There's a story that I'd always overlooked, 
but a friend. It was actually a member of my first congregation. We were teaching a class together. But he, he helped me see this image. So it says, Jesus and his disciples came to the town of Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, can you see anything? And the man was so excited. He was so excited. He said, I can see, I can see, I can see people. Uh, but they look like trees walking. I can't even see shadows now. And so then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. Now, what's that one about? I mean, doesn't Jesus just have the power to heal? I mean, we've seen that a million times before. One of the things that I really like is Jesus didn't heal in the same way every single time because if he did, imagine if, if this was our only story of healing and you came to me for prayers uh, for healing, what I'd have to do is spit on my fingers and touch the part of you that was, was hurting. No, Jesus healed in many ways. The prayer of the faithful is righteous and effective. Uh, no, that wasn't what this was about. And my friend helped me see this. What was, was going on was, this was a parable, okay? Jesus' first touch, he was at the end of his first touch in ministry, and the crowds kept growing. I often do this with people. I go back and I say, read everything that goes on. And they say, uh, Jesus was teaching, he was casting out demons, he was teaching, he was healing people, he was healing people, he was teaching, he was healing people, he did a miracle. He was teaching, he was healing, he did a miracle. He was teaching, healing, miracle, casting out demons again and again. The people saw this and the crowd skyrocketed and that was the first touch. And what was the verdict after the first touch? Next story, immediately after the healing of this blind man, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? First touch. They answered him, well, we think you're John the Baptist, who, by the way, was dead by now, and they figured, well, you got that John the Baptist thing going on. Or, or maybe you're Elijah, and Elijah was the forerunner of the Messiah. And still others said, well, you got to be a prophet. Nobody does this unless they're a prophet. I mean, uh, Elijah, Elisha healed people. You're doing the same kind of thing. You're a prophet. Okay, first touch, crowds grew. Why? And I love John's translation of this. After the feeding of the 5,000, the, Peter, the people chased him down the next day. And he, came to, he told them, listen, you're coming here not because you want to grow spiritually or grow close to the Lord. You just saw the physical things. And that's all you want. You want the physical. You love the miracles. Those are cool. But you don't want me. You don't truly want God. And so... That, who do people say that I am? One of the prophets. And then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And the light finally went on for Peter. He said, you're the Messiah. And Jesus ordered him not to tell anyone. Why? I mean, many times through here, have you ever wondered that? Why do they keep saying, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone? Why? Because we've only had the first touch. We've not had the second touch. First touch, we saw blurry. He's from God. We're pretty darn sure of that. Second touch, we're going to find out that he is the Son of God. No human to this point has said Son of God. When Jesus was baptized, God said Son of God. This is my Son, the Beloved. In the next story, uh, the Transfiguration, we're going to hear Son of God. This is my Son, the Beloved. My Son. We're going to hear that again. But, no human has said this. They're beginning maybe to get Messiah. Okay? Now Jesus then begins to start that second touch. Immediately the next verse. He says, then he began to teach them that the Son of Man, it was a less offensive term, but it's the way he referred to himself, but it reflected his humanity. 
he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite plainly. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter's like, Peter just said, you know, and we heard in one of the Gospels, we, we, we read it in our Gospel lesson for today. Peter said, you're the Messiah, and Jesus said, on you I'm going to build the church, or at least on your confession uh, that you're the Messiah, I'm going to build the church. But Peter, you're the head of this group. Church is going to be built. And Peter immediately takes that role upon himself and says, uh, you can't be saying that you're going to die. We don't want you to die. Nobody wants you to die. Look at all those crowds. You can do great things in this world. You can't die. And Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. For you're speaking Satan's things. You're speaking worldly things. You are not speaking the things of God. And so he called the crowd and disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves. Deny what we think is what we want and what we need. Deny ourselves and follow him. All right? And here begins the second touch. And I want you to know that the crowd went like this. Now the crowd's going to start going like that. Jesus is the Messiah. He's just told them he's going to be crucified, died, buried, and rise again. He immediately goes to the mountain. They see him in his glory. I'm going to rise again. I'm going to raise to the right hand of the Father. They see him in his glory. The voice comes, this is my son. They fall down. They come off the mountain. And uh, Jesus tells them again, I'm going to suffer and die. And instead of following him and begin trying to comprehend what that means, uh, the disciples start arguing, which of us is the greatest? Just like the crowd starts going down. Uh, Jesus begins to teach, and now his teachings have teeth. They're not just the friendly teachings like, love your neighbor. Now they're the things like, uh, he's going to teach, he's going to sharpen the law. And they're going to be more and more challenged. Uh, he's going to tell them again that uh, he's going to die, and James and John begin to fall away going, hey, when you get into that kingdom you're talking about, well, let one of us sit on your left and one of us on your right. We're the guys. <laughs> it keeps going down and down and down. The crowd hailed him as a king on Palm Sunday. By Friday they were crying, crucify him. The way that the image works in Mark, it's not that there weren't other people crucified with him, but that wasn't the focus. The focus was that his Judas betrayed him, Peter denied him, all of the disciples fled. It's not that his mother didn't come, but there is that loneliness on the cross. He went from zero to two to four to 20,000 down to essentially zero. He was figuratively dying alone for our sin. And what happened after Jesus died for our sins? It says, When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that he breathed this, in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. He was the first to say son of God, first human. It wasn't a disciple. It wasn't a follower. It was a foreigner a Gentile, a soldier. 
he was the first to recognize truly this man is the Son of God. And so here, the Gospel of Mark, it ends abruptly. If you look in your Bible, you'll see the shorter ending, you'll see the longer ending. The most original texts end abruptly. Jesus rose, he appeared, and it says uh, the women went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. End of the gospel. Terror, fear, fleeing, saying nothing, end of the gospel. And if you've been following along with this, if you've been watching that rise, if you started questioning when he said he must suffer and die, and yet he did, when his teachings begin to get harder, we liked it when it was easy and he was just the miracle worker, first touch. The second touch was sin matters. It matters so much that I'm going to die for it. When we minimize the cost of sin, do you know what we're doing? We're saying, calling Jesus a fool for dying on the cross. We get to the end. We've seen all of this. If we were first century people reading this story for the first time, we ought to go, I was beginning to love that man. His sacrifice for me upon the cross. And he rises. But everybody flees. And I believe the brilliance of the Gospel of Mark. He's probably the very first one to write this any of the Gospels, is he was driving us back to the beginning to read it again. This time, not who is Jesus, but who am I? Am I going to be a casual follower who only wants things when it's easy and good? Am I going to desert him like Judas? Am I going to desert him like Peter? Or am I going to risk everything to follow him? Because he is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, my Savior. We can make all the excuses in the world. The whole purpose of the Old Testament, my opinion, is that we need a Savior. And who he, here he is. Am I going to follow? Am I going to bow down? Am I going to worship? Am I going to deny myself? and take up my cross and follow him. Amen.